Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. In this episode, we are discussing Herbert Marcuse's 1967 essay, The End of Utopia. If you haven't checked out our series on Marcuse's book, One Dimensional Man, I highly suggest that you do so. Um, we'll be talking about a few different ideas from that book um, in this episode as well. He kind of expands upon some of the ideas from that book in this essay um, and, yeah, relates to that a little bit. So if you want to go check out that series, uh, we have an entire four-part series on One Dimensional Man. End of Utopia was actually delivered as a lecture at the Free University of Berlin in 1967 and then was published uh, shortly thereafter. We're going to kind of break this down and talk about basically four different parts of the essay that I think are important. We'll first explain what he means by this term end of utopia. When he says that, what does he mean by that? He then talks about how this is the end of history, so we'll discuss that as well. Then he says, as a result, that it's perhaps time for us to consider a redefinition of socialism and what that means and of man himself. And then he kind of ends talking about technological transformation and what that means. If you're familiar with Marcuse's work, um, some of these concepts will be familiar um, already. Anything to add before we start? All right. So. If you remember uh, One Dimensional Man at all, if you've read that or if you've watched our episodes, Marcuse talks about, he creates criteria in the last section of that book for how to judge potential future, he calls them projects, but basically potential futures. So when we are talking about a future ideal society, essentially, how do we judge those? What are the criteria for how we can kind of objectively decide whether those um, are right or not? The first one is, quote, the transcendent project must be in accordance with the real possibilities open at the attained level of the material and intellectual culture. Okay, so basically, if we have this potential future that we are imagining, that it must be materially and ideologically possible given the present. So we must have achieved a certain level of technology and so forth, this material world and a level of thinking that makes it possible to bring in that potential future into existence. So that's his criteria, one of the first criteria for how to judge potential futures. The reason that's, go ahead. I mean, which is interesting given that, that, that part of the end of utopia, or not the end of utopia, utopia one dimensional man that mm -hmm. we were talking about was this idea of seeking some sort of paradigm shift towards the end there, right. where we can't necessarily even perceive what's next. Like those of us living in the now can't perceive like what that radical change might be because mm -hmm. it will be such a radical paradigm shift this seems to kind of challenge that notion and this of course is written later right what three yeah. years later mm -hmm. so yeah i mean it's interesting and yeah. i'm and i'm not trying to like like catch him in 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 some sort of like i don't know between a rock and a hard place in his argumentation mm -hmm. like people people change their arguments and i'm not well, even sure so he was even I just read is from one dimensional man Right. And I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm not even sure even in One Dimensional Man, he was arguing as much for that paradigm yeah. shift as much as we were. Right. And I think that's kind of mm -hmm. what, what came out in that last episode. But well, it's also interesting to think about that, like, is potential, like, potentially he's not saying that we must realize that the future project can be attainable, but that that's just an objective criteria that it right. has to be, right? We may not think that it is, or we may think that it is, but regardless... Like, that's just a truth that must occur, right? Yeah, I think we, yeah, you're right. We might have put a little more onto that. Than I think like we did, alluded, rather than, 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 yeah. Yeah. So the end of utopia for Marcuse is this argument that essentially we've achieved an ideological position and material status, development of technology and so forth, that there isn't any version of society we could imagine that isn't possible right now. So he suggests that society, that as of, and remember he's writing this in the 1960s, so we even had more, obviously, technological developments and so forth. He's, he, this is a quote, Today, any form of the concrete world of human life, any transformation of the technical and natural environment is a possibility. So this is the end of utopia for Marcuse in a nutshell. He's saying that now anything we can imagine, we could put in to effect if we actually wanted to. And then we don't for various reasons, um, which he goes into much more in depth in One Dimensional Man. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to read another. This is a, a little bit of a longer quote by Marcuse that goes into a little more depth here. He says, today we have the capacity to turn the world into hell. 
and we are well on the way to doing so. We also have the capacity to turn it into the opposite of hell. This would mean the end of utopia. That is the refutation of those ideas and theories that use the concept of utopia to denounce certain socio-historical possibilities. All the material and intellectual forces which should be put to work for that realization of a free society are at hand. That they are not used for that purpose is to be attributed to the total mobilization of existing society against its own potential for liberation. But this situation in no way makes the idea of radical transformation itself a utopia. So we could potentially create a society that was defined by uh, true liberation for all human beings, but that society is structured in a way to make that impossible. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about utopia because it is possible. We could potentially do it if we could overcome the oppression of advanced industrial society, to use Marcuse's term. Anything to add before we go on? Uh, no. Okay, no. so I he mean, says, yeah, he yeah. goes specifically... Um, he specifies two different ways that the term utopia are used. So the first one is the subjective and objective factors of a given social situation stand in the way of the transformation, the so-called immaturity of the social situation. So this is if we imagine some society that like literally wasn't possible because the technology and so forth that we have today just makes it where that is impossible. It's impossible for that to come into being. This, is, I think, sort of links back to the previous concepts of utopia, like Thomas More and so forth, where they were imagining these societies where the technological capabilities of their current society very clearly did not exist to make them possible. Marcuse's main argument is that that's not a thing anymore, that we now have any technology we want to create, for example, to solve world hunger and so forth. So that utopia, as it was invented in the past, was actually utopic because the conditions did not exist to bring it into existence. But today, that no longer is possible, is Marcuse's argument. So, yeah, to be clear, he's not arguing that utopia is impossible. He's arguing that the term itself is passe. Exactly. Yeah. Because there's no imagined society that is impossible right. materially and ideologically today. Number two, this is the second way that utopia is used, according to Marcuse. It contradicts certain scientifically established laws, biological laws, physical laws, for example, such projects as the age-old idea of eternal youth or the idea of a return to an alleged golden age. Okay, he says, quote, We can now speak of utopia only in this latter sense, namely when a project for social change contradicts the real laws of nature, end quote. So he says only when there are physical laws that cannot be surmountable does it make sense to use this term utopia. So he says like the uh, quest for immortality, that that is utopian. But that any imagined society, social arrangement and so forth is no longer utopian. It doesn't make sense to use the word in that way anymore. And then I have in my notes the sort of discussion about how even today, like Marcuse is writing this in the 60s, nowadays there are huge efforts funded by billions of dollars to try to overcome even those physical laws. Like tons of funding and scientific research and entrepreneurial effort goes into trying to solve uh, human mortality, just as one example. The work of Ray Kurzweil and like all kinds of other people that are trying to do this, that nowadays in our current century, we've even gone to a point where people are challenging those laws. So for Marcuse, the term utopia really has no meaning anymore when it comes to social change. Any in imagined future can be brought into existence. And that's what Marcuse means by the end of utopia. And most often it's used like when you are engaged in any sort of discourse about whatever ideology, ideologies X, Y, or Z, as the path to some sort mm -hmm. of said utopia, oftentimes that counter argument is is, is an accusation that that oh, yeah. is utopia. Exactly. And, and we need to end that conversation, yep. that, that you're just looking for some sort of pie-in-the-sky pie solution for something that can never come to fruition, when in reality what Marcuse is saying is utopia is not dead because we can't achieve it. Utopia is dead because we can achieve it. Exactly. He's saying so. exactly what he's saying, right? And that, that anyone using, that argues, yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to, no. yeah. And anyone that like kind of argues against it like that is utopic is, is, is I don't want to use this word like an inherent pessimism, but it is their allegiance to um, the system as it exists now for whatever reason, whatever they have that allegiance for. Maybe they've been socialized into it. Maybe they have some sort of uh, material incentive, but they, it's because of their current allegiance. No, that's, that's an excellent yeah. point. Yeah, he's saying the use of the word utopia as a polemic against some imagined future, Right. Th there's no case for that anymore. Right. It's not a thing because there is no such thing as a utopic society. 
we can bring anything into existence. And so, like you said, anyone that uses that term is doing it for ideological reasons, usually, and reasons of oppression and status quo bias and so forth. So that's the end of utopia for Marcuse. Now let's go on. He talks about the end of history, which I find fascinating because most people are probably familiar with this term as used by Francis Fukuyama. He's the one that really, really made it famous. He wrote a book, he wrote an essay first titled The End of History, and then a book titled The End of History and the Last uh, Man. So let's talk about the differences between how Marcuse and Fukuyama uh, use these terms. We'll start with Fukuyama since it's the most uh, popular, and I'll just read a quote from him. He says, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universal universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. So Fukuyama's argument is that basically liberal democracy and capitalism have quote unquote won, right, this historical contest, meaning communism lost. That's his main point. He's writing this in the 1980s, essentially. Um, also, I guess we should give a little context on him. I'm not going to do a bio by any means, but he gets his PhD from Harvard and becomes an analyst for the Rand Corporation. So if you know anything about the Rand Corporation, you know where his ideological um, heart lies. So he's saying liberal democracy won, capitalism won, communism lost forever, and now we are at the end of history. There will be no more transformations of society. There will be no more progression, essentially, ideologically or economically beyond capitalism and liberal democracy. Those two <laughs> things have won out forever. And so that represents the end of history for Fukuyama. Keep in mind, he's writing this after Marcuse is discussing the end of history. So Marcuse's end of history, as you might, as you might imagine, because he doesn't work for the Rand Corporation, um, is quite, uh, slightly different. He says, the end of utopia, quote, can also be understood as the end of history in the very precise sense that the new possibilities for a human society and its environment can no longer be thought of as continuations of the old nor even as existing in the same historical continuum with them. Rather, they presuppo presuppose a break with the historical continuum. They presuppose the qualitative difference between a free society and societies that are still unfree. So unlike Fukuyama's theory, in which the present is the end because there will be no political and ideological development beyond what we have now, Marcuse suggests that a truly free future would be a complete break from the past and the present, and as such, it would represent a complete revolution of history altogether. And this would be the end of history for Marcuse. Any thoughts there? You're the historian here. So specifically from teaching the history of ideology, which is something we actually both do together, uh, in, in the course we would argue, like, we would actually agree whole, wholesale with Marcuse. Like that, like each ideology that we discuss, and we're not going to go through them all. In fact, I think our channel has a couple of, of, of videos that we've created on some of these specific ideologies. But starting with the first set of ideologies, let's, let's say it's patriarchy as like the first ideology and going through modern day capitalism and all of the dozens of ideologies that we analyze in between, there is clearly a emphasis in all of these ideologies to uh, a be universalist uh, b seek intolerance of competing ideologies and narratives and of course exploitation and subjugation usually in the name of some sort of material or perhaps even an ideal reward right like mm -hmm. that's what that's, that is so if we if we follow what Marcuse is saying is once we stop these ideologies stop basically building off each other and they do right like so to an easy example would be uh, what did I use? I used patriarchy as the first one. How did like the monotheistic religions, which came along later, use patriarchy as part of like their ideological control? Mm -hmm. Well, they all did. They all did. To yeah, be, or how is capitalism racist and yeah, like so they're and so forth. Yeah, yeah, or how did capitalism use colonialism, or or mm -hmm. how did colonialism use racism, or vice versa, etc. So these ideologies continue to. Um, I don't want to necessarily say supersede each other. Oftentimes they work in unison, but regardless, when we reach that final ideological discourse or break from ideological discourse altogether and we reach a post-ideological society, that is what Marcuse is saying is the end of history. And it is possible, unlike Fukuyama, right? Mm -hmm. Where he's saying like this macro all in 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 all encompassing exploitative ideology we're living under now is the end of history because it's the last ideology. So mm -hmm. that's the difference. The end, I would argue, at least my interpretation is Marcuse is arguing the end of ideology means the end of history. Fukuyama is arguing that this last ideology is the end of history, and if that's the case, then 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 what are we even trying for, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, like it was Cyberpunk mm -hmm. twenty seventy seven. Yeah, exactly. 
Although, interestingly, whatever. I yeah. Talk about the development of that game and the shit show it was. Yeah. But that's <laughs> a whole other thing. It's a whole other episode uh, that we won't ever do. Anyways. Yeah, we don't. No. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's move on. That's the end of history according to Marcuse and kind of how it uh, differs from Fukuyama's. Uh, it's interesting that, like I said, Marcuse was writing about this before Fukuyama, and Fukuyama pays basically no tribute to Marcuse. He literally mentions him in a footnote. So I have in my notes that, like, Marcuse is not even, like, relegated to the footnote of history. He appears in the footnote of the end of history, which is literally, like, he's in the footnote of the end of history, which I think is ridiculous. And it's not even talking about Marcuse's end of history. He talks about him and his relation to his philosophy of Hegel or something like that, which is just ridiculous. Um, whatever. Okay. Marcuse says he suggests that as a result of the technological achievements and the ideological achievements of society in this end of utopia, that it might perhaps be time for us to redefine socialism and sort of start thinking about perhaps escaping and moving beyond orthodox Marxism. He says, quote, Marx's idea of socialism may not yet represent or no longer represent the determinate negation of capitalism. It was supposed to. That is, today the notion of the end of utopia implies the necessity of at least discussing a new definition of socialism. The discussion would be based on the question whether decisive elements of the Marxian concept of socialism do not belong to a now obsolete stage in the development of the forces of production. So he's basically saying technology has advanced to such a point Marx could abs- obviously not even imagine like I mean, where we have got today, uh, both the positive and the negative aspects of technology. So perhaps it's time for us to start redefining socialism and escaping orthodox Marxism a bit and shaping socialism now based on what is achievable now, the societies that we could bring into existence today. Because clearly Marx back then could not imagine those types of things. And that maybe now we need to start having different conversations um, about socialism. There'll be more on that specifically when we get to the section on technology. He also, as sort of part of redefining socialism, discusses um, class, class reductionism, class divisions, and so forth. And he actually is addressing critics of socialism here, critics of socialism that say, well, in modern society, the antiquated ideas of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and so forth no longer apply. Therefore, Marxism is not applicable at all to uh, advanced industrial society. Marcuse disagrees with this, and he says, quote, the fact that no revolutionary class can be defined in the capitalist countries that are technically most highly developed does not mean that Marxism is utopian. The social agents of revolution, and this is orthodox Marx, are formed only in the process of the transformation itself. And one cannot count on a situation in which the revolutionary forces are there ready-made, so to speak, when the revolutionary movement begins. So, essentially, Marcuse is arguing that the proletariat and the bourgeoisie are not identifiable until the revolution actually happens. They don't exist sitting in wait, he says, ready-made uh, when the revolutionary process begins, that they only form and are identifiable and sort of emerge as a part of the revolutionary transformation. So he's saying that this critique is basically nonsense, that we won't be able to know who the proletariat are and who the bourgeoisie are indefinitely until the revolution is already underway, until it begins. But Thoughts those here. circumstances that will like delineate bourgeoisie from proletarian are different than they were in 1848. And right. I think that's what needs to, to be mm-hmm. made clear that, that, and we talk about this all the time when we uh, meet with various people from different like, you know, like leftist circles and, and, and trying to explain to them why speaking in terms of the 19th century is is not just like passe like but it, it's like it literally it's, doesn't apply anymore yeah, yeah. literally and, and it's so frustrating to talk mm-hmm. to these, these that's not folks. to say like, clearly we would not argue and nor does marcuse that yeah. like everything marx ever said needs to be thrown in the garbage and let's start mm-hmm. over very yeah. clearly his theories are hugely yeah, hugely valuable contributions to historical materialism and and deli- dialectical ma- yeah yeah, yeah like that's all on, right? important but as far as like this the specific argument his vision of tomorrow the future whatever utopia might be the next step to socialism whatever it is it 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 requires updating mm-hmm. uh and it requires like different visions and and we cannot like i said be no, talking. is that even like a critique of marx like yeah, clearly writing in the 1800s there's zero way he could have envisioned facebook like, right which is one of the thing right? but yeah like i mean it's just like 
let's say, practitioners of 2,000-year-old faiths, for example, now speak in terms that are applicable today. I don't know of too many practitioners of those faiths that are still like speaking like Aramaic or something along mm-hmm. those lines. That's a perfect yeah. example. Right. And I they mean, modify like, their belief structures yeah. to apply to modern yeah. society, right? I mean, Clearly. They, I mean, and uh, yeah, I mean, whatever. I was going to make a, a, an off-color <laughs> joke, but we'll keep moving here. No, we'll let's keep, let's, let's keep rolling. Okay, so that's his uh, sort of redefinition of socialism. And he really is just suggesting that the conversation perhaps need to change. There'll be more on that in just a second. Then he talks about, as part of this, a new theory of man. And if you remember in One Dimensional Man, he talks about the difference between false and true needs. False needs are the needs which are imposed by imposed on man by advanced industrial society. They aren't real, clearly. This is like, I think he uses the example of like the larger television and so forth. These are things that we think that we need, but they're clearly not truly what we need we're right. taught to need right consume endlessly and so forth associated with our surrogate activities which yeah. we'll be doing an episode on here uh in the near future he says man must achieve a redefinition of needs in order to realize a new and free society and this is his new theory of man first quote a vital need for freedom is needed, but also a new morality and the negation of the Judeo-Christian morality, which up to now has characterized the history of Western civilizations. So he says we need to redefine our morality altogether. And if you've read One Dimensional Man or an essay on liberation or Eros and Civilization or any of Marcuse's works, uh, you know what he's getting at, too. I'm going to read another quote here. He says, um, basically, he's arguing that if man lacks true need to liberate himself, that true revolution is impossible. Quote, When no vital need to abolish alienated labor exists, when on the contrary there exists a need to continue and extend labor, even when it is no longer socially necessary, when the vital need for joy, for happiness, with a good conscience does not exist, but rather the need you have to earn everything in a life that is miserable as can be, when these vital needs do not exist or are suffocated by repressive ones, it is only to be expected that new technical possibilities actually become new possibilities for repression by domination. So Marcuse, this is really just an extension of his thoughts in One Dimensional Man, that we must develop need, truly a need for true liberation before the revolution can happen. And this is how we must redefine man as we think of ourselves as subjects. And we must establish new identities and refigure out who we are and what we truly need before revolution is possible. Any thoughts on that one? Uh, I mean, it is, it's kind of, uh, to put it in, well, I'll go back to the Judeo-Christian, I was going to say it's come to this, this come to Jesus moment, mm-hmm. right? Like that, that we need to have as a society. But this is where we'll debate. I don't think this is the episode for this debate, but like how do you force a population, whatever that population is, maybe it's a national population, maybe it's a global population, maybe we're talking about millions, maybe we're talking about billions to have that moment. Like mm-hmm. how do we how do we achieve that? It's clearly not through some sort of like inspirational ideology. Like yeah. we're never going to agree that way. Does it have to be thrust upon us by some sort of disaster? Again, this is not Marcuse doesn't talk about this. This is the, mm-hmm. this is just me like theorizing where do we get how do we get there? Um, and I just don't know that anyone has the answer, including Marcuse. Like, yeah. how do we get to that that moment where we mm-hmm. we really have to face who we are, and those and thus our false needs, false ways of getting those needs met, etc. No, exactly. That's a huge question. Okay, now let's talk about the last sort of section where he is discussing technological transformation. And if you followed our episodes or if you've read One Dimensional Man, um, you know about how Marcuse uses um, technology and techniques and so forth, and his thoughts about technology, he says, quote, um, well, first he's talking about needs, right? The new development of needs, quote, would make possible a total technical reorganization of the concrete world of human life. And I believe that new human relations, new relations between men would be possible only in such a reorganized world. So he's talking about the technical reorganization of society. He says, quote, I am not advocating a romantic regression behind technology. On the contrary, I believe that the potential liberating blessings of technology and industrialization will not even begin to be real and visible until capitalist industrialization and capitalist technology have been done away with. So he's saying we must develop these new needs that are for true liberation, and only then can we begin to start using technology to those ends. That technology is used through oppressive means. You have to go back to One Dimensional Man for uh, his long, lengthy, detailed analysis of that 
that only after developing true needs for liber liberation can we begin applying technology to the fulfillment of those true needs. Only then can it be liberating. I struggle with that because like technology is like, and he wrote this in the entire book that we analyzed across four episodes that it, it creates kind of this vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. So like, I guess I'm, I'm struggling to see how that, how we can change our needs while still engaging in the technology that suppresses our true needs right. in, in, in replaces them with these false needs. Well, also as we have to like let Marcuse off the hook more than we do ourselves today because he's writing this in the 1960s, right? Like, that's not to say there wasn't technology, and clearly it wasn't, like, totalitarian and so forth. Right, but, but three like, TV channels is, yeah, like, like three TV channels today. is much less distracting than, yeah. than, than the internet. And Like, yeah. Marcuse, his example he gives in One Dimensional Man, right, is how, like, television going down would do more to end capitalism than anything else, because it would force people to refuse, sort of exist outside of the capitalist indoctrination. Well, nowadays, like, TV would go down, and no one would, like, bat an eye, right? You'd get on Netflix or your phone or you know, right. Reddit, or I mean, we could go on literally forever. But right? that's the point, like this tool right here, and we've talked mm -hmm. about it before in other episodes on completely different topics, this tool is could be a tool of liberation, and yet nine times out of ten, it's a tool for oppression. Right. It exactly. could be, like it is literally the democratization of information. You can find anything you out want here, and yet, what are we doing? What are we mm -hmm. using it for? We're using it to, I don't know, watch the most recent Marvel movie, or look at cat videos, or right. buy a bunch of crap we don't need uh, from a giant corporation that is exploiting its labor. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Yep. So we're going to end with two pieces of advice that Marcuse provides for how to discuss these things. He says, we must try to discuss and define without inhibitions even when it may seem ridiculous, the qualitative difference between socialist society as a free society and the existing society. And then the next thing relates to that. He says, quote, Marxism must risk defining freedom in such a way that people become conscious of and recognize it as something that is nowhere already in existence. And that last point, I think, is crucial, that we must stop defining freedom in the freedoms that we already have now in present society, because Marcuse argues don't, those aren't true freedoms. Right. That we must take risks and start defining freedom in such a way that does not already exist. And only then can we begin to sort of escape our indoctrination and think about the world in ways that are qualitatively different than just continuing to have the same conversation about more productivity and more efficiency and so forth, which Marcuse argues even yeah. the left is guilty of. So yeah, arguing that 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 we need to get to the level of, and I hear this often on the left, of like a Sweden or a Finland or a Denmark. Or, no, those it, Marcuse, you need to take a step beyond that. Like mm -hmm. define your freedoms by freedoms that do not yet exist. Um, you know, freedom obviously, as we've talked about before, is not being yeah. able to choose between different phones or cars or two different soda companies. It's more than that. So we need to redefine what that means. It's not being able able to go get a haircut in the middle of a pandemic for a specific demographic of our listeners here. <laughs> right. That's not freedom, right? Like yeah. we need to, we need to get outside of that. Well, and even like, uh, yeah. even on the left, right? The ideas of like fully automated space, luxury communism, like absurdities, Marcuse is straight critiquing that, right? Yeah, like so That's not the point. It's not more of something. It's a qualitative redefinition of freedom and what that means. And only once we have those conversations and redefine these terms, can we begin to bring that type, uh, a society which would embody those freedoms into existence. All right. We should go on forever on yeah, this Yeah, I was going to say, but... there's one quote that I was thinking of before yeah. we before we uh, outro here real quick. And I, I was going to look it up real fast, but now we don't have time because I don't want to take up too much time. But it was something along the lines, so I'm going to paraphrase here, nor do I remember who, who said it, but it's something along the lines of, the end of Marx's dreams doesn't mean to stop dreaming. And again, that's a paraphrase, but that's yeah. that's that's essentially, I think, what Mark Hughes is getting after. 100%. Yeah. I love that. All right. Catch us online. Our website's revolutionandideology.com. We're on Twitter at Rev and Ideology. Um, if you really, really enjoy what we're doing, you can support us on Patreon. We are patreon.com slash revolutionandideology. I'm Nick. Jared. Later.